To introduce this year's final enshrinee, Isaiah Thomas, here's his sponsor and the man who coached him through 10 seasons with the Pistons, Chuck Daly. Thank you, Ahmad. In 1984, uh, I joined Bill Davidson's uh, Detroit Pistons organization, and there were a group of players there. Three of them are sitting there, Bell Lambeer, Vinnie Johnson, Joe Dumars came a little bit later, and of course, Isaiah Thomas over the left. Um, we had won, uh, they had won 35 games, I think, the year before, and I thought the coach had done a pretty good job, and I thought I'm in for a short term, but little did I know about the desire of this particular group, and particularly the captain, Isaiah Thomas. Obviously, a player to be inducted in the Hall of Fame has to have all of the physical qualities, goes without saying. The player I'm introducing has won at every level, with Bobby Knight in Indiana, won the NCAA championship, had won in high school, and then with the Detroit Pistons winning two times back-to-back -back championships. Searching uh, in introducing Isaiah, it, you start searching for words because you see a video like this and you really don't have to say a great deal because you know he was destined to be here from very early on. There was no question about it. But there are some words. First of all, charismatic. Uh, the smile, the charm, um, lights up every room, every organization he's with. Exciting. Uh, Hubie knows about that. 16 points in 94 seconds. And we all saw what the video showed. He did it time and time again and under the toughest of circumstances. Uh, intelligence about the game, always challenging you as a coach about what we're doing, what we're not doing, what we could be doing, always. Courageous, can't say enough about him. You saw that uh, broken hand. They didn't discuss that. One year he played half a season with a broken hand. The night he played in L.A. with the, you should have seen the, uh, the uh, ankle when he came to the arena. I didn't think he was going to play at all. But he had that kind of courage. And finally, I think maybe the key word of all. Uh, during 10 years when you coach a player as challenging as Isaiah, you're not always, not always on the best of terms. Not always. And we were going through a period where we were basically, I don't think the players even know, we were only talking on the court for whatever reason. I don't think he, he remembers or I remember. But one night crossing in the hall after a game, I said something to the effect, what do you do best? He said, I lead best. And of all the players I've seen come and go, he is, and that's a long career, 44 years, he is one of the greatest leaders I've ever seen. And I think any player who played with him would understand what I'm talking about. Now he's in the coaching regime, and there's only one thing I'm a little bit ticked off about, and that's he's dressing better than I am and I'm waving the, ra the white flag, Isaiah, I give up. <laughs> At any rate, if he had been five inches taller, I'm not sure he wouldn't have been the greatest player that ever played the game with all the characteristics he has. My honor, my privilege to introduce Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> by his son, Joshua. Isaiah Thomas, you've been a winner your entire life at every level of the game with everything you've ever touched. But your greatest gift might have been the inspiration that you've given to thousands of young players who can dare now to have a dream to. By vote of the Honors Committee, it is a privilege with the power of the Board of Trustees to induct you as a player into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Congratulations, I think. Well, I guess there's um, one thing that, um, you know, we still have in common, Chuck. I, I stole from you, my son, both and I dress like you tonight. We all have on the same outfit almost. So I didn't, I didn't prepare a speech. Um, I thought it would be best that I just came here and spoke from my heart and tried to tell you how I really feel about this moment.
As I stand here before you tonight as the proud son of Mary Thomas, my mom, who, oh, come on. <clears throat> my mom who left Vicksburg, Mississippi at 14 years of age to go to a place called Chicago. She would sit us down on many nights and tell us how she fought hard for us to grow up to be men, to be educated, and to have a fair chance and a fair shot. So as I stand here before you tonight, I want to thank my mom for all her hard fought, hard struggles, hard days, and hard nights in raising us and making sure that we as a first generation of Thomases from Vicksburg, Mississippi, came here and make sure that we give our second generation a chance to enjoy a better life. So thanks, Mom, for being the mom. I also want to thank a lot of people that have helped me along the way become the person that I am and the basketball player that I was. As Meadowlock Lemon, stood up here and talked about how I stopped him in the airport to make sure that I thanked him. It was more than that, because when I was a young man, 10 years old, at the Martin Luther King Boys Club, I was introduced to a gentleman by the name of John McClendon. And on that same day, John McClendon brought the rejects from Converse, the gym shoes. And he would pull up and open up his trunk, and he would let us go in the back of his trunk to get gym shoes. And they were never the same size. And I remember that day. I had a powder blue pair of Converse. One was an eight and a half, and the other one was an eight. We were headed down to watch the Globetrotters dedicate at that time, rededicate at that time, a place they called the Civic Center. They were renaming it the Daily Center. And there was a woman by the name of Eloise Saperstein who would give money to the Boys Club, who would take care of us as kids, buy us hot dogs, hamburgers, and I remember we went down to the Daily Center, and I had on my powder blue gym shoes, and my dirty socks, and my dirty uniform, and my nappy hair, and my stomach growling for food. But I remember the Globetrotters came out and they put on the show. And I'll never forget Curly Neal and Marcus Haynes dribbling that basketball. And Curly Neal called a lot of us out into the cement where they were doing the show. And he was patting that thing. And they were all patting it. And they was dribbling it like they were playing the piano. And I said to myself that day, I'm going to learn how to do that. So when you talked about the carnation can, the onion sack, and the hanger, I went home, and my mom will remember this, my brothers will remember this when I say it, 
and my sister will remember it. I got a milk crate, and I set it in front of the house. I wasn't tall enough to hang it on anything. We were living on Menard and Adams, and I got my basketball, and I went to dribbling and shooting it in the milk crate. I was even dunking then <laughs> in the milk crate. But that inspired me. That day, that gave me the power to dream, the power to hope, and the power to be. My grade school coach, who's here tonight, Chuck Murphy, owe oh, a lot of thanks to him. And my high school coach, who's here in the audience tonight, I owe a great deal of thanks to him, Mr. Gene Pingator. I was fortunate enough at a very early young age to be introduced to the game of basketball the correct way. I was taught the values of the game. I was taught the spirituality of the game. I was taught the sanctity of the game. I was fortunate enough to come from a school of thought of basketball that preached teammates, that preached giving of yourself making each other better. And through making each other better, you can form relationships and make each other better as people. Gene Pingator, Chuck Murphy, Dean Smith is sitting here tonight. He and Bob Knight invented this offense called the passing game, free flowing, free thought. And I was indoctrinated into that school of thought at a very young age. I went to Indiana University, played under Coach Knight, had a wonderful career there, but I also had some tough times at Indiana University because had it not been for my mom, I probably would have ended up going to the University of Hawaii. That was my choice. But my mom wanted a man who would continue to instill the values and the morals that she had given us at home. So when I went to Indiana University, I went to Indiana University as a senior out of high school, not wanting to go to class, wanted to know where my stereo was, wanted to know when I was going to get my car on campus, wanted to know when I was going to be treated special. And when I got to Indiana University, I was reminded again that I had to be a teammate. And in order to be a good teammate, you had to make other people better, not only on the floor, but off the floor. And as I sit out here, as I stand here and I look at some of my high school teammates, my high school buddies, my high school friends who have been with me from God knows when. Brewer, thanks for letting me eat your food. <laughs> Hector, Ernie. I mean, those guys were with me when I didn't have anything. But when I got to the pros, after I left Indiana University, I ran into another group of gentlemen. I was drafted by the Detroit Pistons in 1981. And I remember at that time, I wanted to go back home to Chicago. I wanted to be close to my mom. I wanted to be close to my family. And the first person I met was Will Robinson. And Will said to me, as only Will can say, champ, you're going to love this place. <laughs> and I said, Will, I don't know. I said, I don't know anybody in Detroit. I want to go home. He said, this will be your home when it's all said and done. Will and I talked, and I went back home, and I got a call from Coach McClendon. 
And I, I didn't know Will, but I told Coach McClendon I just got off the phone and, you know, I talked to Will Robinson and he said, oh, Coach Rob, he's the best. Not only is he the best, you can't fool him. I thought I could get over again. But again, I went from someone who believed in strong discipline, morals, work ethic. Will told me that if we won here in Detroit, it would be the greatest story in NBA history. I didn't believe him. I was fortunate enough at that time, Mr. D was the owner, Oscar, Tom, and Jack McCloskey was our general manager. Jack, too, believed in the same school of thought, same philosophy of basketball. And Mr. D gave us all the financial means, laid everything out for us to become a first-class organization. He understood the fight, he understood the struggle, and he supported us. Not only did he support us with his finan financial dollars, but he supported us with his spirit. And I'll never forget the time when we went to Israel and we went to the Wailing Wall. We had just lost to Boston. We went to visit the Wailing Wall and he said, you know, I didn't know much about the Wailing Wall. He said, I asked him, I said, well, what are these little notes in the Welling Wall? I mean, what are those things for? He said, well, you know, it's old saying if you write a little note on there and you stick it in the wall, you know, you make a wish, it comes true. Well, on that day, I wish that the NBA, that we win the NBA championship. I folded it up and I stuck it in the wall. Now, I'm not saying that that's the reason why we won, but it probably had a lot to do with it. <laughs> but we had some great times in Detroit, and none of that couldn't have been accomplished without the support of strong management, strong owner, and also great teammates. And as I stand here before you today, and I accept this award, I accept it on behalf of all the teammates and friends and family members that I've had. Lambeer, Benny Johnson, Joe Dumars, who's sitting in the audience. I heard Adrian Dantley was here tonight. Adrian Dantley, who's here. I want to say to all of you, thank you for helping me and helping us accomplish this goal tonight. And I hope all of you feel just as proud as I do of the honor that we've accomplished. And Lambeer, I know you probably never thought that you would get this warm of an ovation in this state. <laughs> <laughs> You guys will be my teammates and my family members for life. And I know there's not a day that I wake up or a day that I live that there's not some part of all of you that I carry deep in my soul. And to Coach Chuck Daly, who let all of us be men, and who let all of us think we were doing the right thing, but all along we were executing his agenda. I'd like to thank you for the conversation that you had with me after I won the MVP in Denver in 84. And I remember getting on the bus in New Jersey that morning, you asked me a question. You said, do you want to be known in this league 
for being a great player? Or do you want to be known for being a champion? And then you told me the story of Julius Irving, of how he had to make that transition and what he had to do. I thank you for taking the time to stick with me and not giving up on me and helping me become the person and the player that I became. I had Dave Gavitt as an Olympic coach. We didn't get a chance to go to Russia. I'm not so sure my mom would have let me go in anyway. <laughs> but had we gone, I know we would have won because you had us working and you had us competing. And thank you for that time that we spent here in Connecticut and also in Providence. And last but not least, the new organization that I'm with, the Indiana Pacers, Mr. Donnie Walsh, David Kahn, and my new Pacer family. I said to you, Donnie, when you hired me, that we would win a championship. I intend to make good on my word. But I also said to you that after we win the first one, we would have to sit down and talk because I don't know if I would have the stamina to get the second one. <laughs> but I want to thank you for accepting me in your organization and thank you for making me a part of the Pacers tradition. Last but not least, I'd like to thank my immediate family, my wife, my kids, mom, sisters, niece, brother, Raquel, Ashanti, Jessica. I mean, everyone who has been a part of my life in this second generation to come, you have a responsibility to live up to the name of Thomas's. You have a responsibility to give back to your grandmother and continue to make her proud as I hope that I have made you proud here tonight, Mom. Thank all of you. I appreciate the love. I appreciate letting me come into your house. And to the group that comes in with us, who are with me, I like to say that in the words of Al McGuire, when he said, use the game of basketball, don't let basketball use you. Al, while you're still alive, I can honestly tell you, I use the game of basketball. <laughs> Thank you.